Hey guys, how's it going? Mr Mitchell here. In this video we're going to go over exactly what you need to know and be able to do for the electromagnetism topic of the Advanced Higher Physics course. So let's get going. Now the SQA splits the electromagnetism topic into three subtopics or three key areas. These are fields as shown there. We've also got circuits and we've also got electromagnetic radiation. So we're going to look at each section in turn and look at the learning outcomes. So for fields, first of all, you need to know that an electric field is the region that surrounds electrically charged particles in which a force is exerted on other electrically charged particles. So that is essentially your definition of what an electric field is. You should also be able to define electric field strength as the electrical force acting on unit positive charge. So remember, we don't talk about negative charge for this definition, we talk about unit positive charge. It then says to sketch electric field patterns around single point charges, a system of charges and in a uniform electric field. So that just means between two parallel plates. Next, you need to be able to define electrical potential at a point as the work done in moving unit positive charge from infinity to that point. Another definition there. Know that the energy required to move charge between two points in an electric field is independent of the path taken. Next, you need to be able to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving electrical force F, electrical potential V and electric field strength E around a point charge and a system of charges. So here we have Coulomb's inverse square law, F equals Q1 Q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared. We have the equation for electrical potential at a point V which is equal to Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R and we also have the electric field strength equation E equals Q over over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. You also need to be able to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving charge, energy, potential difference and electric field strength in situations involving a uniform electric field. So for uniform electric fields we have this equation for electric force F equals QE, we have this equation for electrical potential V equals ED and the equation for work done on a charged particle W equals QV. Moving on, you need to know Millikan's experimental method for determining the charge on an electron. And we go over this in the theory video of Millikan's oil drop experiment. Next it says to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving the motion of charged particles in uniform electric fields. So we've got these three equations again which were up here which we saw earlier, but there's an extra one here as well. So it's F equals QE again, V equals ED, W equals QV, and the last one is the equation for kinetic energy of the particle EK equals a half mv squared. Moving on, it says to know that the electron volt, which has the symbol E capital V, is the energy required when one electron accelerates through a potential difference of one volt. So this is essentially a definition of the electron volt. You also need to convert between electron volts and joules. So that is so that means if you're given a number in a so that means if you're given a value in electron volts, you need to be able to convert it into joules, whereas if you're given a value in joules, you need to be able to convert that into electron volts as well. So that's all to do with electric field stuff, and now we're on to the magnetic field stuff, where it says to know that electrons are in motion around atomic nuclei, just your basic model of the atom, and individually produce a magnetic effect. So these electrons produce things called dipoles or dipole moments which have a magnetic effect. Next it says to know that for example iron, nickel, cobalt and some rare earths exhibit a magnetic effect called ferromagnetism in which magnetic dipoles can be made to align, resulting in the material becoming magnetised. Moving on, you need to be able to sketch magnetic field patterns between magnetic poles north and south and around solenoids, including the magnetic field pattern around the Earth. So we looked at that as an example of magnetic fields in the theory video on magnetic fields and magnetic field patterns. Next it says to compare gravitational, electrostatic, magnetic and nuclear forces in terms of the relative strength and range. So this was recapped from the higher physics course which we did in the theory video on comparing fields and forces. Next, you need to be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving magnetic induction around a current carrying wire which has the symbol B, the current in the wire I and the perpendicular distance from the wire which is this R. So this gives the equation B equals mu naught I over 2 pi R. It then says to explain the helical path followed by a moving charged particle in a magnetic field. So you need to be able to say why we get the helical motion and remember it's to do with the two components of the velocity vector of the charged particle that's moving at an angle to the magnetic field. Field. So remember the component of the particle's velocity parallel to the magnetic field gives rise to the pitch in the helix, whereas the component of the particle's velocity perpendicular to the magnetic field gives the circular motion. And lastly for fields it says to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving the forces acting on a current carrying wire in a magnetic field and a charged particle in a magnetic field. So the equation for forces acting on a current carrying wire is F equals ILB sine theta. And we've also got the equation for the force on a charged particle moving perpendicular to a magnetic field, which is F equals QVB, 
and also the equation for centripetal force, F equals mv squared over r. And remember it's the magnetic force that causes the centripetal acceleration of the particle, and therefore the centripetal force. So we can end up equating these two force equations together to get an expression for the radius of curvature, which is often seen in mass spectrometer questions. We're now on to section 2 of electromagnetism, which is circuits. So it says to know the variation of current and potential difference with time in an RC circuit during charging and discharging. So these were graphs that you should remember for a higher level where we plotted potential difference or voltage across a capacitor against time and also current in a capacitor or current in the circuit against time. Next we have a definition, so it says to define the time constant for an RC circuit as the time to increase the charge stored by 63% of the difference between initial charge and full charge, or if it's a discharging capacitor, the time taken to discharge the capacitor to 37% of initial charge. Next it says to use an appropriate relationship to determine the time constant for an RC circuit, and this is given by the equation tau equals RC. Then says know that in an RC circuit an uncharged capacitor can be considered to be fully charged after a time approximately equal to 5 tau. So that's 5 times the time constant. And also know that in an RC circuit a fully charged capacitor can be considered to be fully discharged after a time approximately equal to 5 tau. Again 5 times the time constant. You should also be able to graphically determine the time constant for an RC circuit, i.e. find the time constant for a charging or a discharging graph of voltage across the capacitor against time. Moving on it says to know that capacitive reactance is the opposition of a capacitor to changing current. So this is just a definition of capacitive reactance. And then you need to be able to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving capacitive reactance, voltage, current, frequency and capacitance, where you get two equations in terms of Xe, so Xe equals E over I and Xe equals 1 over 2 pi Fc. So that's all the capacitor stuff there, and now we're on to the inductor stuff of the circuits topic. So first you need to know the growth and decay of current in a DC circuit containing an inductor. So remember, for a DC circuit containing an inductor, as soon as you close the switch, the current will increase exponentially over time up to a maximum value, and then when you open the switch, the current will decrease over time to a minimum value of zero. And the time taken for that current to increase and decrease is all to do with this thing called a back EMF and Lenz's law. It then says to explain the self-inductance, which can be shortened to inductance of a coil. And again, this can be done using Lenz's law and the idea of a back EMF. So we should know Lenz's law and its implications and be able to define inductance and back EMF. So remember when a current passes through an inductor in a DC circuit, this sets up a magnetic field around the inductor which stores energy. And this magnetic field induces this thing called a back EMF which opposes the change in current which is causing it. And this relates to Lenz's law which states that an inductor will oppose the change in current that causes it. Next it says to know that energy is stored in the magnetic field around a current carrying inductor. And remember that if a switch is opened in a circuit so that the current through an inductor suddenly stops, then the magnetic field will suddenly collapse and this will release a large amount of energy in a short time, which can create flashes of light or sometimes sparks. Moving on, it says to know the variation of current with frequency in an AC circuit containing an inductor. So remember a graph of this shows that current is directly proportional to 1 over the frequency. Or in other words, current is inversely proportional to frequency for an inductor in an AC circuit. It then says to know that inductive reactance is the opposition of an inductor to changing current. So there's your definition of inductive reactance that you need to know. And lastly, use appropriate relationships to solve problems relating to inductive reactance, voltage, current, frequency, energy and self-inductance. So we have epsilon equals minus L di by dt for the self-induced or back EMF. We've got the energy equation E equals a half Li squared. And we've got the two equations for inductive reactance. So we've got XL equals V over I and XL equals 2 pi FL. Lastly, for section 3 on electromagnetic radiation, there's not much here, but you need to have knowledge of the unification of electricity and magnetism. So this just means you should have an idea of James Clerk Maxwell's four equations, which help to combine electricity and magnetism into one theory, i.e. one thing called electromagnetism. It then says to know that electromagnetic radiation exhibits wave properties as it transfers energy through space. You should know that this wave has both electric and magnetic field components, which oscillate in phase, perpendicular to each other and to the direction of energy propagation or direction of travel of the wave. Lastly, you should be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving the speed of light, the permittivity of free space and the permeability of free space, where we've got this equation C equals 1 over root epsilon naught mu naught, where these two are constants on your data sheet. That's all for this video folks, thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.